Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the TOT Doctors Roundtable. If you haven't already, please subscribe by hitting that red button and the notification bell so you won't miss anything. So today we have uh, on our panel Dr. Dr. Jeffrey Rutterbush. Uh, welcome, Jeffrey. Well, thanks for having me, Stephen. Yes, my uh, pleasure. Normally, we were still waiting for uh, Dr. Eric Serrano. We will see if we can make it or not. Anyway, so... Um, Dr. Jeffrey Rutterbush is in our closed and free Facebook group, uh, TRT and Hormone Optimization Therapy, HOT. And if you are watching this video right now, you surely must be interested. And if you haven't already, please join that group as well. The link you will find under this video. So first, we'll have a couple of pre prepared questions. And uh, afterwards, we will take um, the questions from the Q&A live stream chat box. So I see already some people are watching. So in that chat box, your questions will be monitored and filtered by our moderators. Normally, Danny Bossa and Wakit Janjua would be in it. And uh, they are also the moderators in our uh, HOT Facebook group. So I already want to thank you guys for doing that for us. So, okay. So let's start with the first questions. So Jeffrey, what are your thoughts uh, on using uh, GABA concerning indications, dosing, and studies on long-term safety? Do you have any experience with it? I have personal experiences and uh, experiences with patients currently. Um, I use GABA a lot as a uh, neuroinhibitory uh, uh, device and more, or chemical or element. Um, it helps me sleep. Uh, I have in my current practice, I've compounded through Olympia Pharmacy. I've got this little vial right here. This vial right here is a 10 ml vial of a, of a uh, called Body Calm. And it has uh, gamma amino butyric acid, which is GABA, mm -hmm. 50 milligrams. And it has magnesium, 50 milligrams, taurine, 50 milligrams, and theanine, 50 milligrams. So, I give this, I subscribe this or prescribe it to my men who are, have anxiety levels or can't sleep very well because I have found that when they do one ml injection of that concoction, it relaxes them. And GABA has been known to be very, very uh, relaxing elements, you know, theanine, uh, of course. So not only do I use GABA, amongst other things, help me sleep, but that uh, concoction right here I showed you, uh, I I prescribe to my men who come in and they all claim to me that one ml of that in the evening prior to repose, that's Shakespearean for sleep, um, it does calm them, it helps them sleep and get a better night's sleep. So GABA is well known for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of dose uh, do you recommend? A 50 to 100 milligrams. Um, I wouldn't go above 100. I'd say in this compound, it's, it's, it's 50 milligrams, but there's a synergistic effect with the magnesium and the uh, theanine. Uh, so, it, you know, again, one plus one equals three is a synergistic effect. Um, there are tablets you can take, you know, pills you can take with, with GABA. Uh, I find 50 to 100 milligrams PO at night works very well. But then again, I, I, I do it in addition to my uh, melatonin. I okay. know we have that on listed next, but uh, together they work very well for me and very well for my patients to get great nights sleeps. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Dr. Keith Nichols recommends melatonin uh, for its uh, anti-aging properties, for uh, anti-cancer properties uh, and so on. So uh, do you give that uh, to your patients as well for these reasons next to helping uh, them sleep? Yes. Uh, my doses for patients to help them sleep, you go low and start low and go slow. In other words, I'll start them on one to three milligrams mm -hmm. at night. But I have patients that have gone up to 60 milligrams. I think I heard Eric Serrano saying that he's had patients go up to 90. But the research on cancer is very specific, Stephen. You've got to be above 20 milligrams of this stuff, melatonin at night, to start kicking in the anti-cancer therapeutic benefits. Mm -hmm. So I currently take 30 milligrams at night. Because that's, that's got me dialed in to good REM sleep. It's above the 20 milligrams baseline to start getting the anti-cancer effects. 
So yes, it's been well researched uh, as an anti-neoplastic agent uh, and anti-cancer. I do have to say that God was very smart by putting the pineal body in with the brain <laughs> because melatonin is the prime antioxidant that the brain bathes in at night to quash, scavenge free radicals. Mm -hmm. the, the brain does not have a, a lymphatic system like our, our, our body does. So at night, the, the, the brain has to bathe in this own melatonin, which is a very, very, very powerful antioxidant to, uh, to um, again, make for a good night's sleep and to, again, scavenge the free radicals, which is formed during the daytime. So melatonin, I'm, I'm a big proponent of melatonin in all my guys. Uh, but again, the dose ranges. I've got guys that can't tolerate more than three milligrams. I've got guys that have to go up to 60 milligrams um, to get the therapeutic benefits and not, of course, wake up with a hangover, the melatonin hangover, which is just a simple indication that you're doing too much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Someone in the um, question box already asked, uh, did you ever try 5-HTP uh, with your GABA? Yes. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of ways to, uh, to do. I've, I've used 5-HTP as an appetite suppressor for my weight loss patients. It does quash appetites. So I have used it, and I do think there's a there's a place in a, a physician's pharmacopoeia to use 5-HTP. Mm -hmm. But that's not a standard thing that you take uh, every day, for example. I take melatonin, been taking melatonin every night, 30 milligrams for a decade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the other question concerns uh, magnesium. I already uh, heard you mention it uh, a moment ago. Yes. So what, what kind of um, doses uh, do you recommend? And uh, what kind of magnesium? Because you have all different kinds of magnesium. Yes. All right. That's one of my favorite topics. Um, there's a book by Dr. Carolyn Dean, The Magnesium Miracle. She's a medical doctor and naturopath. This is the most current edition. She is the foremost knowledgeable source I've ever come across on magnesium, all right? Let me give you some statistics on magnesium. 1968, it was determined that it was responsible uh, in over 300 enzymatic processes in the body. So that number has stuck around, but guess what? New research indicates that it's actually evolved in between seven and 800 enzymatic processes in the body and up to 80 percent of my patients and all americans are magnesium deficient okay plus um if you know anything about the krebs cycle and the tca cycle it drives atp and energy there's eight steps in the tca or krebs cycle magnesium is 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 involved in six of those eight steps it's critical so I'm a big, big, big proponent of, of magnesium uh, supplementation. Uh, anything that cramps, anything that twitches is usually a magnesium deficiency. You really, uh, now the, talk about the dosages of magnesium, oh, the, best, the best form, mag citrate, mag, um, mag glycinate. Mag chloride is the very common, it's inexpensive mag oxide, um, but that's, you know, milk of magnesium. And it's used to go into the gut and, and draw, you know, have, you know, you empty your bowels. So the problem with the cheapest magnesium or mag oxide or mag chloride is it, it's a good bowel evacuator, you know. So you can have loose stools with high doses of magnesium. I find that if I, if I combine it with glycinate or citrate, though, in particular, but I still prefer glycinate. Um, but I, I like doing... Oh, six to 800 milligrams of magnesium using divided doses. Um, and since it has a calming, relaxing effect, I'll take it like a 200 milligrams in the, in the, during the daytime, morning, and take a 400 at night, or I'll go 200 in the morning and 600 at night. Part of my sleep therapy is magnesium, about six to 800 milligrams at night, Melatonin, 30 milligrams. Now, 
I do take 10,000 IUs of vitamin D at night because, and I know Eric Serrano uh, uh, was saying you can take it at nighttime. You think about it. When you are a kid and you're outside and you're getting a lot of sun, don't you sleep very well at night? You've gotten a great dose of vitamin D. So I take my vitamin D at nighttime with my melatonin and with my magnesium to get a good night's sleep. Okay. Yeah, I hear several uh, people say and on websites always take your vitamin D in the morning, but you have a different take on it. I understand. Yeah, I, I, well, you can take it in the morning, but I just take it at night. And I don't take it right before I go to bed. I'll take it an hour before I go to bed. You know, it's a fat soluble. It's a fat soluble vitamin, but we know it's not really a vitamin. It's a pro hormone. But this so I take all my fat soluble vitamins with like a tablespoon of fish oil, a tablespoon of olive oil or a tablespoon of cod liver oil. Mm -hmm. It's better absorbed to take it with an oil. Yeah. I always take it with my um, omega-3 uh, fatty acids. Uh, that Those are fish oils, of course, yeah? Yes. Okay, so uh, I, I'm informed in the chat box, Jeffrey, that uh, Dr. Eric Serrano is coming on in a moment. Uh, we okay. will see. Danny Bossa had uh, have, uh, texted him, so he still coming, okay. So um, the next topic uh, that uh, we prepared was about uh, Tutka. Uh, yeah, so well, what is it good well, for? Do we need to supplement it? All right, this is where I'm going to draw on Eric's uh, experience again. We will ask I'm, him. Uh, I'm aware of Tutka and Utka from being stationed in Iceland and working with the strongmen, you know, contestants over there. We talked about Magnus for Magnuson back in the mid '90s. I was made aware of, of that as a liver cleansing agent primarily through the strongman contestants in, in Iceland back in the mid nineties. I personally have never used it as a liver cleanser. So I can't speak to it. I, I never prescribed it for my own patients, but I'm aware of it through the strongman contestants and the guys that do you know heavy, heavy doses of anabolics. And it's supposed to be a great liver cleanser is supposed to have some great ocular health uh, component to it too, but I can't speak to it from my own experiences. I okay. do know this in Iceland, the problem, <laughs> the controversy was they were getting it from bear livers. Um, and so that was causing some, some problems with uh, the sourcing and people had uh, the PETA people up and honest about that. Okay, I know it is used uh, for liver protection uh, while people are taking uh, anabolic steroids. Um, should people just on TRT take that as well? No. Well, my my take on hepato uh, hepatic protective hepatoprotective device or chemicals is obviously we know about milk thistle, but one of your topics here is NAC. I'm a big, 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 big proponent of using NAC. Okay. Or as a liver protectant. So I not, not only do I use it, I prescribe it. Okay. I don't prescribe Tutka or Utka. I don't use prescribe milk thistle. I use NAC okay. as a hepatoprotective uh, agent. So that's uh, N-acetylcysteine as a liver protection for only for people taking uh, anabolic steroids? No, or? no, sir. I mean, um, I mean, definitely yes for those running super physiological doses, physiological doses. I, I'm a big proponent of it as people come in all the time, they're overweight, or I know they have fatty liver disease. You can look at their body habitus. You look at their lipids and the triglycerides. Uh, I run GGT a lot, gamma glutamyl transferase and see that if that's, that's above between that's above 10 or 15, they have fatty liver disease. So I, and most of my patients do, they're on the standard American diet, which is sad. And so I do run NAC, I suggest NAC a lot for all my patients, definitively for those running TOT, those physiological, physiological dosing and super physiologically dosing, and just in a general liver health, if, for, if the blood work indicates they have of fatty liver disease and probably three-fourths of my patients show me on lab work and body habitus that they have some sort of fatty liver disease. Mm -hmm. 
And what's the dose of the neck that you're uh, recommending? Personally, personally, I that runs anywhere from my dose is 900 BID, so I'm running 1800 milligrams uh, total. But the usual dose of neck is I mean I run it anywhere from uh, one to three grams. But I've had I've I've had patients I've run it uh, up to 8,000 milligrams a day. I mean people who had really really toxic looking livers uh, and were on high dose uh, anabolics that I think really needed to detoxify. So I run it up to 8,000 milligrams a day with no no problems, no side effects. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question we have already, maybe I'll take one from the chat box. Um, someone asks, any recommendations for vitamin C dosage per day? <laughs> yes, for sure. All right. I'm, a, I'm an active member of the Orthomolecular Society. I write journal for the Journal of the Orthomolecular Society. Ortho, you know, that was founded by Linus Pauling in the late 60s. Ortho meaning similar or of like molecules. So you want to heal body's disease processes with, with vitamins and minerals, which are enablers versus disablers, which are synthetic chemicals. So back to your vitamin C. Yes, vitamin C is so, so, so important. I, I take two to four grams of vitamin C every day, usually a thousand milligrams or a gram per meal. So depending on how, how many meals I'm eating, I'm doing a two to 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day. Now, if I'm gonna get sick, if I feel somebody's coming on sickness, I'll check that vitamin C up to, up to 18, 20 grams. And I think Dr. Eric will agree with me. I'll, I'll ramp up vitamin D to 50 to 100,000 units along with vitamin A. I learned that trick from Dr. Mayer, Mayer Eisenstein, who's now deceased, but that's a great trick, uh, vitamin D, vitamin A and vitamin C to mitigate, you know, flus or common cold. But I'm a big proponent as per Linus Pauling of vitamin C. Okay, well, welcome, Eric. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, I was there. I was working on the... Hey, Eric. How, how are you, sir? Sorry I'm late. No problem. Any friend of Dr. Alex Vasquez is a friend of mine. I know Alex from 15 years now very well. Well, Alex, Alex is a special person. You know, I love I, he's, so, a, he's a very <laughs> smart guy. Oh, as, as it comes to planes, I, I think there's a few that I will say are up to par with him. Not only that, he's a person that is able to teach and put on perspective, and I like how he thinks and what I like. And sometimes I would try to be able to, I don't know, people that like me because I don't tend to learn too much, but his knowledge is beyond. I mean, he's incredible. So I say so. Stephen, I was working on the farm. Oh, were you, Eric? Okay. So we're live for the moment. We already have a lot of questions and topics that we have covered. Um, Jeffrey, what topic did you want us to address uh, back to Eric uh, now he is on? Oh, yeah. Eric, I'm yes. going to defer, defer to you. When I was living in Iceland and working with strongman contestants like Dr. I mean, Magnus for Magnuson, who was the world's strongest man back in the mid-90s when I was living there. Yes, sir. Um, the, the issue is this. Um, I've never used or prescribed Tudka or Udka. I know what it does, and uh, they were using it as a liver cleanser back in the, you know, in Iceland. But do you have any personal experiences with using it or prescribing it? Because I do not. Oh, so, okay. First of all, for people that do know what he is talking about, Tudka is actually classified as a bile acid, and um, Tudka basically it was isolated. What is those is to clean up the loop when you have certain but is this is a great question because bilat is one of my favorite subjects and toka is an isolation now i want to discuss toka because that's the question i was asked have i have i used it i have to spike do i use it all the time no the best because it's one component of the body and people don't understand the important the gold 
But the guys that were using, were using top so they were using orthopedic aids, of course, and in this case, patients, so that it helped deliver. Actually, I had about, I would say, between both guys that were taking and the liver ends, actually, uh, I would say, with a normal limit for a well, and it made a difference in the liver ends. The other thing that a talk cat does, people are not aware of that, put the gallbladder of people like the pregnancy, women that are pregnant that lost the gallbladder, uh, talk cat makes a big difference on digestion. Uh, the belief of that it also helps with liver disease, one of the worst, the most common liver disease right now. Uh, I will say this, I rarely look at any, prefer to use ox bile, large quantity. The reason I do that, but I will know that bile acids actually require to work in the other this receptor for a neural work they go brother better but also our body to pour to teeth. So a lot of people like removed for weight so their thyroid doesn't work. Now I want to say this the thyroid don't work because the absorption of the vitamin compromise fat soluble vitamin vitamin A but E, vitamin K, and when when uh, this happens, now the receptor that is a, is a vitamin A receptor gets compromised. Actually, the thyroid receptor is like thyroid receptor, and that allows you not to lose weight. Now, most uh, lifters were used for the protection of the liver work. Uh, more ox bile, more than talk, I want to provide the people with as much as Eric, you're, you're very difficult to to, uh, to understand. You know. Okay, let me. I, I think your connection is bad, and uh, yeah. We... Hold on, let me check. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, I think uh, Eric's connection is very poor. I lost his, his photo, too. I lost his image. Yeah, now he's totally gone, I guess. Okay, so um, let's cover another question I had here. Um, Jeffrey, what vitamins, minerals, and supplements would you recommend just to everyone without measuring or testing? Versus which one would you test uh, first for uh, before uh, correcting? Well, first of all, uh, everybody, everybody needs to be on a good multivitamin. There's a, uh, it's been determined by the Orthomolecular Society that every American, if they were to do just an inexpensive, inexpensive multivitamin, 48,000 lives would be saved every year. That may not sound like a lot, but if you might, if you were one of those 48,000, it can mean a lot to you. So that's an inexpensive one, like a, like a, you know, one a day or a centrum. But if you want to get a pharmacy grade multivite, like through Ultra Preventive 10 or Designs for Health or Asana a Lab, that number of 48,000 could be probably triple or quadruple of lives saved just by going on a multi. So again, I don't do lab values for uh, for multivites. I don't do lab values for vitamin C. Eric's big on SpectraCell. I run SpectraCell. Uh, I think it's a good company, but the problem I have late with SpectraCell is they've been erratic in both pricing of labs and getting the labs back to me. So um, I'm, I'm on board with Eric doing the micronutrient testing, the SpectraCell labs. But no, I don't run tests for, for recommending a multivite. I don't reckon, uh, run tests for, for uh, recommending higher dose of vitamin C. I don't run tests for recommending uh, a good source of natural vitamin E, which you, you know has there's eight vitamin E's, eight tocopherols, and eight tocotrienols. So it has to be a natural one, uh, not a, a synthetic vitamin E. But I don't, I don't run last for that. The only thing that I will run last for 
before I start and then watch, watch is, is vitamin D, which we know is not a vitamin, it's a pro-hormone. I'll, I'll watch vitamin D uh, levels. And I'm looking for greater than 70, not 60. I, I like above 70 because it's shown that the thyroid gland won't function optimally until you're at least above 70. My vitamin D is currently between 100 and 110. I do, I get sunlight. And I do 10,000 I use a vitamin D every night, every night. So that's how I get my vitamin D levels, 90 to 100, 110. But I've, I've got people on higher doses and their, their vitamin D is upwards of 150. For years, they run 150. No complications whatsoever. And what's the advantage of being uh, above uh, 70 with your vitamin D? Uh, for the thyroid. Vitamin D is the most powerful immune modulator known to mankind. If everybody's vitamin D could be optimized, we would decrease mortality and morbidity by about 77%. That's yeah. a big number. It is. 77% decrease in cancers and chronic disease just by optimizing vitamin D. Think about this. For those of you who aren't physicians, when we're doing, how many people you see that have muscle mass and have a good suntan are sick? I'll tell you, when I was a medical student, resident, intern, whatever, you go through the hospital, they're all cachectic and they're all pale. Uh, maybe there's something to have a good suntan, vitamin D optimization, and not being sarcopenic. Now, a famous saying, one thing, you're always you move. So you have the muscle mass to move well, you're not very old. So again, I'm getting off topic, but vitamin D is very, very, very important. I think it's the most powerful immune modulator known to mankind. So I definitely like checking D and I like it above 70 to optimize thyroid. There's other things you need to have optimal thyroid, though we're not going to that right now, but definitely D above 70. But my runs 100, 110 routinely. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and again, uh, you, mentioned, you, you mentioned this, it's got to be D3 with K2, K2, and I prefer the MK7 mm -hmm. uh, variant. And you guys touched on this before, but it's got, you got to have uh, vitamin K to direct calcium to the proper body depots, bone and teeth, not mm -hmm. soft tissue. Mm -hmm. Never, you know, mentioned that too, but I'm I'm on board with that. I concur 110%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome back, Eric. I'm back. Can you hear me now? We hear you. Much fine. better. Yeah, much better. Corey, let me answer that question now. Coco, yes. We use that. That's a type of bile acid. We used to use it a lot in the United States. We still do. And we use, we use it for liver disease. The... The lifters were using it because they were taking ergogenic aids, okay, supplements all the time. And they said that it protects the liver. And actually, also some of them said that they help them lose weight or keep lean body mass. Uh, I did have some, like about 12, 15 of them on the Tokka product, but I completely changed. And I was explaining, and I apologize to the listeners. I changed from Tokka to Oxpile. The reason is that Tokka is a specific bile acid over the multiple bile acids are in the body. We do not know all of them. Cholesterol is part of the bile acid and all these things are part of the bile acid. Tocca was isolated, of course, as a drug. Now, when people use Tocca, they were using it because supposedly it protected the liver, which it did, it protected the liver. And when you follow their blood levels, and in this case, AST, ALT or liver enzymes, the old ones were called SGLT and SGOT, and even alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin, you saw that TOCA will bring those levels down, which is very, very impressive. Now, I stopped using TOCA, and I was explaining, because now I use oxbile. The reason I use oxbile is because now there are, in bile acids, there are signals that we were not aware of about it. And one of them is, believe it or not, bile activates T4 to T3. And I got some cool research on how bile affects the T4 receptor. 
not only directly, but indirectly. When we have bile acid that is not uh, correctly mixed or created within the liver and into the gallbladder, we affect the absorption of ADEC, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. And when we do that, the vitamin A uh, levels are affected. But the biggest problem is that thyroid, that's, that's why people, when they remove the gallbladder, they get fatter. Number one. Number two is when you remove the gallbladder, they get depressed. One is because the absorption of vitamin D gets compromised. Two is vitamin A is necessary for thyroid. And some people that do not respond to thyroid, you're giving tons of thyroid and they do not, hey, I don't respond. It's because vitamin A is compromised. And the key here is that the thyroid receptor, and let me be more specific, vitamin A or retinoic acid thyroid receptor is dependent on vitamin A. So some people are not absorbing the required vitamin A and their thyroid doesn't work correctly. So it is very important to be aware of that. But I, I didn't use Totka in the past, now I use Oxbile. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey was a very big proponent, uh, Eric, of uh, NAC uh, using uh, to protect the liver. Uh, Do you prescribe uh, that as well? Absolutely. I'm going to agree with Jeffrey. NAC is, first of all, you know, it's kind of funny how physicians, we tell people, oh, detoxification doesn't exist. Oh, detoxification of the liver is baloney or bullshit, excuse me. And it's kind of funny, but I work in the ER for two years. And as soon as somebody walked in with talent overdose, what do we give that patient? NAC, NAC. Yeah. And the Good reason it helped the liver get rid of it, which is yeah. funny because Tylenol is the number one reason for coming to the ER with liver failure. It's not even alcohol, it's Tylenol overdose. So NAC is an amazing, amazing supplement. Number one is the only one with coenzyme Q10 to extend life on the research, which is crazy. And NAC is also used for so many other things. People are not aware of this. For people with polycystic ovary syndrome, NAC makes a huge, huge difference. He said, because it's helping the liver work better. I have no idea, but I use NAC almost in everywhere. I have a supplement called liver detox and I have high levels of dosages of, of NAC. It's very, it's a great supplement, it's cheap. It's worth the price because it helps you with anything that you have on the liver. And the other cool thing is I fed both phases, phase zero and phase one and phase two which most people think, oh, it's phase, it's phase only two because it's a system derivative, but it also affects phase one, which makes them work correctly because if phase one is working, but phase two is not working, you're accumulating toxins, but if phase two is working and phase one is not working, you still have issues. So it's a very, very cool supplement. Someone asked in the chat box about that. Do you see a reduction in ferritin due to NAC use? I see a reduction on, on ferritin. Okay, this is a this is a very interesting question. Yes, I do. Now I want to explain this. Ferritin in higher levels is a pro-inflammatory, meaning, and 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 I know that I need to talk a little bit anabolic steroids, okay? Because on my past or dealing with them, I hemoglobin goes up, correct? When you take anabolic steroids or even testosterone. Now once it goes up, hemoglobin has to be made, and you require iron to make hemoglobin. So people do not know this, but testosterone or any type of anabolic steroid increases the absorption of iron into the blood because it has to make more hemoglobin. Okay, well NAC does decrease ferritin levels because ferritin at high levels will act as a pro-inflammatory. So the body is able to actually clean NAC, or uh, excuse me, clean ferritin levels or prevent the oxidation of it. That's why it's clean. Yes, it lowers ferritin levels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone asked because a moment ago, just before you came back, Eric, we were talking about vitamin D again. And um, someone asked, it was a Wakit from the chat box, um, what would one notice in their lives if they had a low vitamin D and then increased it to normal? Uh, what would be the benefits? Uh, okay. Now, I, any monkey can order a lab. Any monkey can read a lab, but a few doctors can interpret it, the labs. Okay, so I don't want people to go there, oh, my vitamin D levels are low. No, it depends. And uh, let me explain why, Stephen, let me, let me explain why, Jeff. I can have great vitamin D levels, but if I have a BDR mutation, vitamin D receptor mutation, a vitamin D carrier mutation, uh, my vitamin D levels that are normal are not normal because I have a defect on my transport there or a defect on the key lock 
component. So what are normal vitamin D levels? It all depends on the person. Now, what will I see with a person that truly have low values to normal values or to, I don't like to use the word normal values because even normal values for somebody might be 50 and for me might be 80 or 90. For example, I take 20,000 I use of vitamin D, okay, which is a lot. And the reason is I come from an area that is that was always sunny. Now I live in an area that is not sunny, so I need higher levels. Things that I will see with vitamin D actually decrease joint pain. I do see that. If you have patches and you have psoriasis, you might decrease patches, joint pain. You also have like a cess for life. I know this is very hard to say, but I ask my patients, hey, do you feel better? Oh, I feel less sad. I feel like I want to go outside more often. So that's a, that's a change right there. Now, again, it depends what optimal level is for each client because somebody can be 70 or another client can be 80. I have an accident, as you can tell. I, I had a patient that has psoriasis, right? And with my accident, I said, oh, you take, you take more vitamin D, don't worry about it. You know, well, this guy comes back, tells me, Eric, I feel wonderful. I don't have no patches. I have no joint pain. I feel absolutely wonderful. So I said, oh, how much are you taking, 10, 15? He said, Eric, 10, 15. You told me to go up until I felt better. I said, oh, shit, how much are you taking? 80,000 I use, okay? And I and I go, what? You know, you're going to be toxic, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I told him, you know what? Reduce it and then go down to 40 and then we go down to 10. Well, he called me three days later and he said, listen to me. Your accident is, I'm taking 80,000. I went down to 40. My joint pain came back. My, my rash came back. So I said, go back to 80. I never have checked his levels of vitamin D because I don't want to know what they are, but I did check a vitamin D receptor gene mutation, and he had both. So this guy needs 80,000, which, what are his levels? The last time I measured them, they were 164. You know, uh, Eric, uh, uh, Alex Vasquez made me wear, very aware of the VDR. Alex wrote a book one time on the uh, musculoskeletal textbook of natural medicines, and in that, he was very specific about um, uh, vitamin D deficiency causing all types of body pains, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I was a physician for a few years in Kuwait. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very bright, sunny area, but they wear the burqa. And so they're always, they don't get the sun. And I cannot tell you the number of times they come in and they would say to me in their broken English, pain, pain too much, pain, pain. So they heard everywhere, like myofascial pain syndrome, they had joint pains, they had bone pain, and they were all significantly vitamin D deficient. So I would ramp up their vitamin D and inevitably, probably 90 to 95% would lose significant amounts of the myofascial pain syndromes they suffer from, the joint pain, the bone pain. But I learned that trick from Alex Vasquez. I, well, saw it, I saw it firsthand in Kuwait. Absolutely. You know, it's kind of interesting you brought that up, especially with the joint pain. One, pe one thing that people do not know is this. To absorb vitamin D, you need boron. People are not even know what boron is, by the way. When you start getting vitamin D, Stephen, your boron absorption increases. And boron actually stops arthritis pain. And boron is one of the most significant minerals that our people are not aware of. They're, they're deficient. Or affects the binding of SHBG to testosterone. For example, I don't want to lower SHBG, but I want to increase your free testosterone. Or at 10 milligrams makes a huge, massive difference on freeing free testosterone, okay? So that's one thing. Now, when you start adding vitamin D, what Jeffrey was doing also, increasing the absorption of boron, we absolutely stopped arthritic pain. That is amazing, amazing. Not only that, and people are not aware of that, which mineral is absolutely necessary to absorb vitamin D? Magnesium. And I will send the papers to you, Jeffrey. I'll send those to you, Stephen, too. Thanks. So I have a lot of vitamin D. I love it. That is a great, great supplement that makes a massive difference. I think it's probably one of the most powerful immune modulators known to mankind. Absolutely. So that is standard uh, vitamin D with uh, vitamin K2 and yeah. uh, boron 10 milligrams. Uh, minimum boron 10 milligrams. Now I have used boron up to 20 milligrams to stop arthritic pain or actually on people that have 
machine splints, believe it or not, boron makes a difference. Another thing that I've used, uh, and Jeffrey might deal with this a lot, I don't know you do, Stephen, people with osteosclerotic disease, you get vitamin E, okay, 800 I use, vitamin selenium e. 400 e. micrograms, and boron 10 milligrams, and the pain will go away within 10 days. Yeah, incredible. So, okay. Thanks for all those tips. And, and Eric, that was that was Osgood Slaughter's you mentioned, yeah. right? And that was vitamin E you mentioned. Vitamin E, you need 800 I use, okay? You need selenium, 200 to 400 micrograms, and you have boron 10 milligrams, and it works. It works. Jeffrey, you see, actually, within three days, the pain stops. It's insane. Well, I see a lot of Osgood Slaughter disorders and uh, as a sports med doc, for sure. I will send you papers on that, too. Please, thank you. Great. Another question we had prepared. Um, what can you do to increase libido when testosterone is already optimized? So, for example, levels uh, of a total testosterone of uh, 1,200 and free testosterone levels of 50. So uh, the patient is uh, feeling fine, optimized, but still there's a lack of libido. So uh, right. what let, are the let options? Me go, let me let me go first, Eric, because you go I know first, you, Jeffrey. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to learn. Yeah, well, this is a funny one because this is what I do for a limb right now. I, I'm currently the medical director of Men's Sexual Health Clinic, where, and this is a common disorder I see, right? And I'm going to come at this a different angle. Guys come in, they're up, they're optimized on paper, you know. They, and again, I don't, I don't treat numbers, but I get a common complaint. I just don't feel like my lib lib libido, libido is, is up there yet. So I asked them, there's a thing called beautiful strange. Y'all know what beautiful strange is? No. Beautiful strange is <sighs> different women. Okay, so first thing I asked them, no, serious, my point though is that I'll ask these guys, okay, so with your wife, the libido is not there, but uh, uh can you masturbate to pornography? And if you do, how's your how's your erections? Man, rock hard, man. I'm getting hard, get turned on. Or they say, man, if, I, if you dig deep enough, they'll tell you I got a woman on the side. I have no problem with my erectile strength with her. So it may, I step back first of all, and make sure that the guy's not just bored and tired of the same old same old. So I call it beautiful strange. If you're getting beautiful strange, and if it's helping your libido. Well, guess what? That's a you issue, not a me issue as your doctor. Um, but no, that's, 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 but that's common. I see that all the time. I have to delve into that history, get to the real bottom line of why their libido is no longer peaked because they've been married to the same, sorry, fat woman for 30, 40 years. I'm sorry, but I see it all the time. I have to go there with it because, you know, I have to dig deep to find out what the real problem is, psychogenic, my, my friend. And that means, that tells me a lot. Now, oh, I wanna, I, I'm gonna amplify on Jeffrey, okay. Right. Let's talk about two species here, woman and male, because they're different species, okay. Now, I'm gonna give point A to Jeff, because absolutely, you can be, you can have nothing, all of a sudden you see this hot chick, and all of a sudden you have a tingly down there. But now, men thinks with their dicks, okay. Women sing with their brain. So let me let me differentiate here. In some men, and I'm gonna be, so they, on people that have really, I would say organic disease in which they do have issues, okay? Of course, I'm gonna do my test. Thyroid absolutely is associated with libido, okay? So you can have the highest levels of testosterone, but if your thyroid is low, your libido might be gone. I do wanna say that. Now, two, men, if you want to increase your libido on your wife, I am so sorry, but I'm going to tell you this. Do laundry, paint the house, do the dishes. I mean, women are a, a different species, and I'm going to say this. In my practice, I teach men and women, men are microwave oven, on and off. A woman is like a conventional oven, Stephen. Preheat, warm, warmer, broil. So uh, it's totally different in women than men. Now, to tell the guys, I see guys that absolutely have no libido, but they work 50 hours every day. I mean, I'm making that up, but they work all day. They don't sleep and they come back to, to home and they're so tired they can do shit. So I need to look at the stresses, okay? 
and I, and the way I classify stress, Stephen, is totally different than most people classify stress. I have seven stresses. One is physical, meaning are you working overtraining because that will decrease your libido. Physical is are you being abused in the relationship. I also do stresses are chemical, diet and toxins, which are chemical. Economics. If you have a stress economics, of course, you're not going to be able to perform because I got to pay bills. The next one is social. Are you married and you're dating somebody else? Are you married and getting divorced or whatever? Those things are getting affected. Environment. Do you work on the lights? Are you in Ohio and there's no light? Okay, I got to think about that. Religion. I am having sex with a stranger. I feel guilty. That's going to change your libido. Genetics, do you have mutations? So I look at those seven things before I make my approach. Now, for women, I said also, women have, have one, 10 things on men. I call it the 10 S. Sensitive, selfless, smart, sexy, uh, what is it? Sincere, security, uh, sanitary, all this crap. Men, when I was younger, Stephen, I call it the two F. I don't want to say the first F, but it was something with sex. And the second F was food, right? As I got older, as I got older, and I see a lot of this in couple, okay, men like flexibility in a woman. And I'm not talking about opening the legs. I'm talking about if I go play golf, I want my wife to go play golf with me, right? Even though she hates it. And another thing that women do forget respect. I've seen so many couples in which the man loses libido because he comes home and tells the kids, clean, clean the room, and here comes the wife, oh, don't worry about it, or, oh, don't do this. Respect as a man is such a huge, huge deal that I see it over and over actually coming up. My wife, when I ask them, well, I tell my wife to come to bed. Oh, no, I got to do laundry. Oh, I got to do this. The respect is so important for a man that they lose that respect when they go to bed. They don't have nothing left. So I look at the whole entire picture. I hope that answers. Now, if people want blood tests, if your levels are really high, then go ahead and check your zinc levels, okay? Go ahead and check your vitamin D levels. Go ahead and check your thyroid levels. Make sure that you don't have lead or mercury or any toxin out there that is affecting you. And also in this, in this community, make sure that you're not taking SSRIs, Effexor, you know, all those drugs that will affect beta blockers. Almost every blood pressure affects your libido, so be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to piggyback on to that. Um, I found, uh, you know, you are into nutrition, uh, Eric. I have three, actually, degrees in nutrition, and I'm also boarded in functional medicine, uh, thanks to uh, Alex Vasquez. But I, I'll check for homocysteine, too, and if I find a homocysteine is high, I got to treat that, bring it down, and I can I can improve erectile function and, and libido by lowering homocysteine with B1, B1, B6, folate. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Great point. Absolutely. So there are no uh, supplements to take uh, like, because uh, oh. people are always asking in the group uh, Tadalafil, for example, but that's no, not for no, libido. No. Tadalafil is not deal with that daily. I got guys on Tadalafil does not increase the libido at all. Let me tell you something. That's my job right now. But I mean, Eric mentioned a good, I mean, boron. Yeah, I thought he put a guy on boron if his libido is not there, but everything else seems optimized. It'll increase his drive. Um, sometimes my guys, Say that they have a better drive on HCG with their testosterone. Um, I don't know. And you mentioned Eric mentioned zinc. How many times you guys remember going? I love I love oysters. I can't tell you when I was you know a younger man, or even 30s, 40s, 50s. I'm in mid 60s. But if I ate a dozen, a dozen to 12, uh, two dozen oysters, I'd have wood. So I ask guys about that. Do you like do you like oysters? Yeah. You you wake up in the morning with with hard direction. Yeah, I do. Well, you're zinc deficient, buddy. And a friend of mine, Dr. Mark Gordon, um, he recommends zinc up to uh, 60 milligrams three times a day. That's a long. That's and a hefty. That load. is. And I I don't I don't know. You got to worry about copper with that. But I, I if it works, I say well don't do it very very uh very very long. But he recommends. Uh, uh, as an aromatase inhibitor, that zinc at that high. But again, zinc will get your libido up, in my opinion. Boron will. Some guys say that HCG works, but, but I always check homocysteine. And if that's too high, uh, that sometimes will correct the issue if I just 
lower that as should be because uh, homocysteine kind of acts as a taco burr going down the vasculature, irritating endothelial vasculature. So it's got to be minimal, it's got to be kept that in That is track. awesome. You know, Jeffrey, and I want to piggyback on this because you might know something. In my practice, I see a lot, a lot of men in ketogenic diet, low carbohydrate diet. And I used to do the low carbohydrate diet all the time, Stephen, all the time. And when I was competing, actually, I used to very successfully. But I noticed that my libido went down and my erections were compromised. And I would eat pizza or, or a bunch of rice. All the suddenly that night and that morning, I was like Superman. I, I, and, you know, I tell people that you don't need carbohydrates. I admit it. I'm guilty of that. But shit, when I, I it happens. If I'm eating really well, yeah, here we go. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Go ahead. There's another thing that I, I would consume a lot and notice two things. Better wood and a lot better pump in the morning. If I, yes. had, a bunch of, if I had a bunch of watermelon at night, big watermelon, big, I would have a great workout and I'd have wood. Yes. If you're low carbohydrate, eat some carbs. That would yeah. increase your libido and better erections yeah. too. Yeah. So, hey, so, but I, I, um, have you heard of a, of a, of a, uh, compound called, uh, PT-141 or bremelanotide? Because I use that a lot, uh, for my guys who are failing. I haven't used it. How does it work? Oh, it works very well. Uh, uh up to 80% of my guys that fail PDE five eyes, if I give them, you know, 0.5 to one milligram sub Q, uh, 80% of them will get wood that lasts for hours. So I'm, um, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with it. I probably got about a dozen guys on it now that uh, were failing PDE five eyes, but about 80% of them have now uh, told me that uh, they're supporting great wood and having great sex by sub Q remelanotide PT 141. I mean, N of I'm 12 taking, is a, is a I'm lot. Taking, I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes, Jeffrey. I'm taking notes. Yeah, PT-141 or bremelanotide, which is a component of a metabolite of melanotan-2, but there was a serendipitous finding with melanotan-2 that these guys are getting great wood and, and good suntans too. So um, we, uh, in my clinic, we're using bremelanotide, bremelanotide PT-141, 0.5 to 1 milligram sub Q. Uh, it can cause a little, uh, sometimes a little nauseousness but as so I tell them that use it at nighttime, so pin it at nighttime. That way you do have a little nauseousness. It won't affect you as you sleep through it. But uh, most of the guys, again, 80%, the literature says 80% of men failing a PDE 5i will have great results at getting and maintaining erections with uh, PT 141 at the dose. I, just... I, I, I want to explain something to the viewers. Jeffrey is at way advanced. I usually do not like to discuss what Jeffrey's talking about, because I want to say that I'm ignorant about it. But there, for those viewers out there, there's melanotan one and there's melanotan two. I just I just want to make a point, Stephen. I don't know much about it. I just want to mention this, right? One of the biggest effects of this is a ma massive wood, like Jeffrey's saying, actually lasting up to two days. I want to yep. say this. I don't use it. I'm just saying what they tell me. Number one. I've seen two, it. I had a guy. I got it for five days, two guys up for five days. Uh, it, Jeffrey's no lying. It's true. Now, it is, it, it is, I, I, don't, I don't know much about this. I just say for people out there, it's a peptide. Okay. That yes, is yes, actually the true, true definition of this, a peptide. The biggest, biggest side effect actually of this, like Jeffrey was saying, is nausea if you use high dose. And two is the skin color. In some population, it will create more moles. And the reason, and the reason is this, Stephen, is melanotan actually comes from melatonin. And it's a melanocyte type of drug, actually. And what it does, and the reason they were using it initially was to make your skin darker or make your skin a little bit prepared for the sun. So people will use it for three days before going in a trip on the sun, and their skin will respond by getting darker. The problem is that in women, they get big, huge moles. And that was a side effect. And it happens, I would say, 8 to 12% of the time, maybe higher in women and men, maybe about 2 to 3%. I just want to say that. I don't yeah. know much about it, but I just want to say that. Uh, my research and experience is that that was more of a problem with melanotan 1. Yes, but melanotan 2 is not the biggest the big issue. The serendipitous finding, the great thing about melanotan 2 is the, is the uh, serendipitous wood that came about with it. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, and so I'm, uh, I think you were going to, and again, I'm a sports med doc and I, I deal with the sports nutrition a lot. So I think you were going to close with a sports nut- supplement, so forth, right? That were your next, next, uh, next topic, sports supplements, I believe. Even? Yeah. Um, th- there was something about, uh, there was one more question that was prepared. Um, okay. Is there a difference in approach towards hormone optimization in, for example, a 35-year-old regular guy with symptoms of primary uh, hypogonadism versus a 35-year-old athlete that used uh, oral anabolic steroids like Anavar, for example, for years and now experiences a secondary shutdown of his testosterone production? Is there a difference well, in approach uh, for hormone optimization? Well, okay, b- briefly, let me, let me speak. I know that uh, Eric's got a lot to say. Uh, I'm a harm reduction doctor, harm reduction, meaning I'll take on guys who are steroid meatheads, okay? But I'm just listen, I'm, I don't condone it, but I'll try to minimize the harm you may be doing to your body. So they're called harm reduction physicians, all right? Um, first of all, I've never seen a guy come in that was solely on antibiotics. Um, that's for women. That's a women. That's a, a women's favorite uh, uh, anabolic. But uh, I had guys come in all the time, and you know, Eric. Eric knows we got guys coming in. They're, they're running eight, ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty different anabolics. Are stacking this shit, you know, right? Eric knows it. I see it all the time. He knows it, <laughs> especially these strong these strong men. They were showing me stuff they're on shit I never heard of. <laughs> I have to research. They get it from Bulgaria or somewhere in the European bloc. I said, man, I have to research that. They educated me. I dose insulin. They still teach me. They oh, my gosh. Me. These guys are running insulin, and that can be dangerous. Anyhow, um, let, me, let me back up, though. Well, let's, let's, let's finish this talk. So 35 is a good cutoff date. You know, I don't like treating guys uh, below 30 for uh, – uh, with testosterone, uh, I, I look at the F, uh, LH if it's uh, 65 and they're not optimized. I find that HCG is not going to work. So, especially if they're older. But I don't, you're, I think we're talking about PCTs. You run, you're, look, you're looking at PCTs now, post cycle therapies for guy that is either, you know, on, as you mentioned, Enovar. I can't relate to that because nobody's come in ever on one drug. No meat has ever come in on one drug. Especially Only Anavar. woman. Only especially, woman. Yeah, especially, uh, especially, you know, uh, Anavar. They're coming on uh, stack of some stuff. But it depends. You know, I've, I've had guys who, who were on a short cycle. Depends how long they were on the cycle. That their HPT, you know, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, will kick back up in a few months. Six, eight, nine months. Maybe up to a year, it'll kick back up. Sometimes shorter. I've had guys who ran 20 straight years for physiological mega dosing and now they're obviously in the dirt right and um i used to have to give them 300 mg of testosterone a week to get them even near feeling good but now i can't because the pharmacies around here won't let me write for more than 200 mg a week which is ridiculous so i got some guys i can't dial in at 200 mg a week even though they need it because they've been on a high dose for 20, 30 years. Um, so I feel somewhat frustrated by that. Eric, do you have the same thing where your, your pharmacies won't fill more than 200 megs a week? You know what? It's very hard. I'm lucky enough that, you know, I talk to pharmacists. I try to call them and say, listen, it makes, I, I, I'm a pro patient. So I try to call the pharmacy and say, I'm explaining to them why I'm doing it. Now, my approach is a little bit different because I've been seeing them for so many years. And Stephen, I want to answer your question step by step. First of all, you're talking about two different individuals, 35, 35, right? And I, when I approach a person, I need to ask drought because injections are different than orals, okay? I need to know about the amount that we're using because the higher the levels, the worse it might, might be the damage and which type because there are different ones that affect you different. For example, using decaduraboline is going to completely shut your... LHFSH, and you won't even be able to do it. The second question that I asked that person is, do you want to get your wife pregnant? Are you married? Okay, because if that person wants to have sperm count up or sperm count down, whatever they decide to do, I need to know because that's going to affect them later in life. 
I mean, most of the people, most of the people will return, but some people need that. They don't respond and they require ATG depending on what I'm going to do. Now, would I treat them different? Yes, depending on that answer what they're giving me. Now, I see a lot of athletes, and of course, I put an athlete on testosterone, then you get disqualified. So I cannot do that. So it depends on which event they're doing or where they're competing. If they're Olympic athlete, I cannot do that because they would get disqualified. So I have to start, even HCG actually is not accepted. So I have to either use clone or do other routes to do it. So yes, it, it makes a huge difference. Now, again, like I say, route, dose, type, how long have you been using it? Makes a difference on the treatment. Two, do you want to get your wife pregnant or you want to have children? It's going to make a difference also. What sport or where are you competing for me to decide what I'm going to do? Now, if you know, if you don't care about any of those things, I would do what Jeffrey does. Absolutely. Some of those guys might need 400, by the way. And Jeffrey says 300 because he's limited, so he has to say 300. But I have people that need 400. It's the only way that they feel normal. Not how, do the level of, how do you get it? How do you get it? Get, get, how do you get a pharmacy to write, you, give you 400 a week? I can't find one. I have to call, talk to them, and explain it. Oh, okay. Well, they won't budge here in Florida. That's, that They don't do it? No, the pharmacies say, hey, doc, I got a license to lose here, too. And they say that their licensing board will not let them, you know, uh, let go of more than 200 megs a week. I've seen if you document it, Jeffrey, and tell them, listen, this is the reason call the pharmacy. Of course, ph every pharmacy is different. Maybe if you want to use a pharmacy out of the state, maybe it will help you. But, you know, I've been lucky enough. I, I always try, I always treat my pharmacies with respect. You know, I give the benefit of the doubt. There are some pharmacies out there that are like those physicians, don't know nothing. So I try to educate them by faxing them papers and say, this is what I am doing. And for, if there's any pharmacies listening to me or us, I want to say the, the research shows 200, 400, 600, 800. 800 is the maximum dose that you will get benefits in compared to the risk. I want to say that, yes, there are people that will get benefits at 800. Are those and many out there? Very little, very little, because then you have the risk of side effects. 600 is the maximum dose that you would tend to see that will give you the most benefits with probably the lowest risk of the side effects. Now, 400 is actually, I don't see why not. I couldn't argue with somebody telling me, I mean, 400. I can't argue. If Jeffrey tells me he's in 300, Okay. I don't, I'm at, listen, you didn't catch this, Eric. I ran four to 600 milligrams of testosterone a week and 200 milligrams of nandrolone and, uh, and anadrol. I ran that for 20 straight years without doing blood work. And I never felt better. All right. No, I know you can now. You can't. You can't. I mean, this is back in the day. I could write myself the stuff. I would call it in, in college pharmacy, university pharmacy, uh, they would just send it to me. I made a trip to California one time. I took enough of that stuff for two years into California. I had like 100 vials of, of tests and 50 vials of nandrolone. I had everything because I needed enough for two years. But that was before the Anabolic Steroids Act in 1990. You can't, you can't do that. Stephen, I don't know how your country is. Here, here you can. Actually, Jeffrey is absolutely correct. He will lose his license. Actually. Yes, same thing, if, same thing here, same thing here. If, if you write it yourself to your, I mean, if you write it to yourself, you can, actually it's going to the point that if you write it to one of your co-workers, you can even lose your license, which is absolutely crazy. But that's the way it's right here. And he, and it's, I, and I feel bad for people because sometimes, like Jeffrey sees the guy that was taking 15 different drugs. That guy comes over and he wants to, hey, I really want to clean myself. I want to start new I don't want to do that anymore. You put that guy on 200 milligrams, and I'm sorry, you can't. He will not. He won't do nothing. And and sometimes you cannot do anything about that. And you know, and that's when the pharmacist will say, "Hey, this guy looks like a bodybuilder." I know. And Jeffrey, correct me if I'm wrong. He looks like a bodybuilder. Oh no, he's taking he's taking steroid or he's taking testosterone to make himself bigger, which they're not. You know, they're hey, I'm coming off. I want to win myself off, but it's pretty hard. I agree with Jeffrey there. It's frustrating. I got guys coming and say, Doc, I need six. You write me six or 800 a week. I go, no, I can't. I, I mean, I uh, shouldn't. I can't condone that, but I'll write you 200 and you get what you need. 
you get the other stuff on the underground and I'll help you do it safely. That's all I can say. Yes. Happy to do it safe. Okay. So, uh, very good information. Very funny as well. <laughs> okay. Some more questions from the chat box now. Uh, someone, al someone asked, um, is there a recommended intra-workout carb you recommend? Currently, I am taking a tablespoon of raw honey. He stopped taking cyclic dextrin because he wants to avoid corn-based sources. So what do you recommend as an intra-workout carb uh, source? Well, I'm, so I'm sorry, Stephen. I didn't catch the, the, uh, the uh, question. Did you catch the question, Eric? Yeah, I did. They asked what kind of carbohydrate do you want to use during your workout, intra-workout. Oh, carbohydrate. What type of carbohydrate? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I used to do. Okay. You might not remember this, but um, you know, <laughs> first of all, as a sports medicine physician, and one of the check questions, one of the questions we're discussing, the last one is which supplements work, right? And which ones are hype? Let me tell you something. As a board certified sports nutritionist, more, majority of that shit's hype, okay? But there are supplements that do work. They've been highly researched and they work. And that's creatine. It's been around forever. Because it works. Uh, HMB, hydroxyl methylbutyrate, uh, is a metabolite of leucine. Uh, that helps uh, with uh, both buffering intracellularly and it helps minimize the catabolic breakdown of muscle tissue after you work out. So, together, the creatine and HMB together are the most widely utilized and effective sports supplements known to mankind. Why do I say this? Because I'm a member of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, run by the great Dr. Jose Antonio, and uh, you know he has written many books on that. He will tell you right now that those are the he has he's written books. I mean, he's got you can, you can Google Jose Antonio. He has a magazine, a book. Here's one right here: uh, Supplements for Strength and Power Athlete. Okay, and he's got one Supplements for the Endurance Athlete. This is up to date stuff, and the the most reputable. Force nutrition supplements for strength athletes. And of course, the other one he has for endurance. I know, I mean, I've been taking creatine forever with HMB. I also take beta alanine, a bunch of beta alanine, which combines with the uh, uh, histidine in your body to create, to create carnosine. Carnosine is also a great buffering agent. Carnosine is a great anti glycation agent, which is anti aging agent. So I'm, I'm, I really got this dialed in on these sports supplements because, again, as a sports med doc, seeing it, reading it, being a member of the ISSN, a credentialed sports nutritionist, uh, I know what works. And trust me, guys, most of the stuff out there really doesn't work. I, I can't tell you the number of times guys come in and say, doctor, doctor, I'm on, I'm on testosterone. I'm on testosterone. What do you mean, testosterone? Yeah. Uh, you know that big guy, Frank Thompson? He, he he promotes that uh, Nugenic. I said, that's bullshit, man. That doesn't, that doesn't work. I see your testosterone is like, you know, your testosterone is 150. Your free testosterone is 2.8. And you tell me that you're on testosterone? I said, you're not on testosterone. You got to understand, guys. I work in here in Jackson, Oklahoma, which is like lower Georgia. Uh, so they say testosterone. But um, no, that stuff doesn't work. Nugenics. None of those, in my opinion, Eric. None of those oh. testosterone boosters work for shit. <laughs> He asked about cyclodextrin, so let me explain what, so people yes. don't, there's cyclodextrin. Cyclo do, do you know what it is, Steven? Cyclodextrin, yeah. are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I, I use it during an intra-workout, I do. Okay, I am glad that Steven uses intra-workout. Okay, I am a scientist because I did my master's in exercise physiology. I want to give you, I give you an advice. Okay, what is the difference between cyclodextrin, oatmeal, and rice? Nothing but your belly and the price you're paying for it, right? Rice is cheaper way better and it sets better on your stomach. Now, cyclodextrin tend to pull water into your stomach, okay? That's what it makes you absorb. I do not believe, on, I'm one of the few doctors that not believe on cyclodextrin. Now, he asked about cyclodextrin compared to honey. Okay, Steven, I'm gonna give you the worst workout you ever made. 10 sets or 10 reps squat, only resting 30 seconds, and I'm gonna make you a tempo of Six to two. So each repetition is going to last 10 seconds. And I make you do that and I calculate and you have about 220, 230, right, Stephen? How, how big are you? 220? Um, we, we measure in uh, centimeters here, a <laughs> meter oh, 72. Uh, well, okay, kilo. Well, don't matter. But if I do that, you're going to burn about, two, let's say, 
400 calories tops. I know people think, why burn a thousand calories? No. And then you calculate, you only burn about maybe 40% tops carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So let's calculate 40% of 400 calories is how much, how many calories? 160. By 160 by four, how many do you have? 40. Okay. So one tablespoon of honey gives you 35 grams of carbohydrate, which if you put it in your mouth before the workout and you hold it between 30 seconds to a minute, will give you enough glucose for you to have for a one hour workout. Number one. Number two, for that person that has that question, if you can use raw honey, use the one that is close to where you are because the honey is created by what? By collecting pollen around the area where you live. So you have allergies, environmental allergies, and you start doing that every day. Hold the honey in your mouth for 30 seconds to a minute. Do it. You don't believe me? You have sinusitis. You have congestion. Do that every day. It has to be raw honey collected around your area. You will see that your, that your sinuses get better. Your allergies get better because now the body is dealing with that concentration of the pollen. But a tablespoon of honey will give you enough grams of sugar to be able to handle a one-hour workout. Now, we're talking about lifting here. I'm not talking about aerobics, okay? So if you're doing aerobics, another issue. But lifting, one tablespoon of honey hole in your mouth for 30 seconds to one hour, I mean, for 30 seconds to one minute will make a huge difference, yes, without the need of your belly being bloated. Okay, that's very clear. That's very clear. Thanks. We have a few more questions before uh, we shut this down. Um, what was this? Uh, okay, is it beneficial to rotate healthy fat sources to avoid food intolerances? Somebody asked, or do fat sources not matter when it comes in uh, to, to intolerances? Uh, you can get. It is very hard to get a food allergy to a fat. I had. I, I, let me think if I've seen a fat allergy, a pure fat allergy. I, I don't. I have not seen it by testing. I mean by testing. Intolerance is different than allergy. So let me separate that. And intolerance is I cannot either digest it or I cannot do something or I'm eating the wrong fat and that's intolerance. Allergies means it makes me, I eat it and I have a symptom with it. I get rashes, I get whatever. Now, I've never seen it. I've not seen food allergies with fat. Now that, that I got tested, I don't remember. Now, the question again is, do I have food intolerance with fat? Is that what the question was? What was the question? Uh, if one should rotate healthy fat sources. Okay, you should always rotate, always rotate fats, but not in the way you think. Okay, and this is where the educators, or maybe Jeff might have a, a bone with me, a bone with me what I'm going to say. People tell you, dietitians tell you to eat polyunsaturated fats, which is the biggest, I don't give a shit the research, it's the biggest pile of shit, okay? The, in nature, in nature, there's no concentrated sources of polyunsaturated fat, nowhere. Doesn't matter. Now, Stephen, I want to educate you on this. If I buy tuna, if I buy a rib steak, and I buy a, a chicken, which one is the number one fat on those? Do you know, Stephen? The saturated, saturated probably. Saturated, mono, or poly? Which one is number one fat? Probably saturated, even. Wrong. Wrong. It's mono saturated fat. If I make you eat lard, lard, which is a pile of fat, right, from... from from a pig or yeah, beef saddle, a pile of fat from a cow, which one is, a, is that saturated fat or higher monosaturated fat? I would say it's saturated again. No, you're wrong again. It's monosaturated fat. So I'm going, oh my goodness. I'm going to educate you today, Stephen. Okay. No, the most abundant fat in animals is monosaturated fat. What happens is we try, we tend to change the concentration because what we feed the animal. Okay. And if you remember, I raised my own animals. So I tend to test for everything. For example, I tested my eggs and I compare with bought eggs, egg bought in the store and ours has way, way more monosaturated fat than anything else. It's crazy, right? Almost every food is always higher on monosaturated fat. It's just that we believe that it's higher saturated fat, but it's not true. Polyunsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fat concentrated don't exist as set in oils, okay? So the, the dietitians tell you to eat vegetable oils. Do you know an example of one vegetable oil, Stephen? Do you know one? Uh, olive oil. Is that is that a vegetable or a fruit? 
Oh, I put you on the spot. A fruit. Give me another example. Give me one sample of a vegetable oil. You can't see them. They don't exist. They're lying to you. They're bullshitting you. There is no one single vegetable oil. Corn is, a, is what? A grain. Sunflower, almond, coconut, flowers, any of that crap is either seed or fruits. There's no vegetable oil. Have you ever seen broccoli oil? <laughs> You can't because they don't exist, but the dietitians want you to believe, oh, canola, canola oil is a vegetable oil. Really? Well, no, canola oil is not a vegetable oil. First of all, it's toxic. It's toxic to your body, but people don't know that. And we can discuss that later. So the most abundant fat almost in every animal is always monosaturated fat. Only two things in nature have high saturated fats, and they're not in nature, but they're man-created. Butter, okay, and coconut oil are the highest, almost highest concentration of saturated fat. Palm oil is another one. Now, avocado oil is monosaturated fat and then short chain or MCT or saturated fat. So those are oils that are good to cook. So I want to tell them these people. Now, do I rotate your fats? If you're rotating your foods, you will rotate the amount of fat that you consume, not the type of fat. Now, if you're eating shitty cows from they have been fed corn oil or corn seeds or something like that, fine. You get, you're you getting corn oil, by the way, in your in your meat. Now, if you have grass-fed, at my house, what we do is we raise them for a year to two years, okay? And when we're going to get them ready to take them to the market, we feed them flax seed and we feed them natural sources of grain because I want some fat on them. I want that really nice fat, got it? Now, when I do that, I make them a little fat and I change a little of the fat content, but I put the flax seed there to get more omega-3. Now, our, like even if you get salmon, the highest fat on a salmon is not polyunsaturated fat, it's monounsaturated fat also, which is crazy, but people do not know that. They have been lying to us so much. I gave a lecture last year at Ohio State, and it's crazy what they tell you that you need fat, polyunsaturated fat. They do not exist except in canola oil, in freaking corn oil, in oils that we should not use. That's why they get oxidized. That's why they're not good for you. You consume them, and in your body, they get oxidized. In nature, nature did not want polyunsaturated fat because they're not good for you. So that's my take. Jeffrey, I don't know if you agree with me. No, I, I, I agree with what you say. Some of the things you tell me I, I wasn't aware of. Um, I know though that fats are mal uh, maligned. I mean, they're maligned. I know they're very healthy. I do know this when I was living in, in Iceland and Greenland, uh, and the Inuit Indians and Eskimos were living on whale blubber, you know, for most of the year, and they were, weren't having, you know, heart attack, no heart disease. I'm thinking something's wrong with this diet, cholesterol, heart disease hypothesis. It's all uh, it's been it's been shown to be disproved. All it does is sell uh, statin uh, medicines for the uh, big pharma, but yeah, uh, fats are, I think the most misunderstood macronutrient, uh, known to mankind. Yeah. Absolutely. Most misunderstood. I, I mean, I love fat, Steven, you know, and he's one of my favorite subjects. Actually, I manipulate fat loading and fat unloading. So I will use fat loading. I do it with olive oil or avocado, oil, depending on what I'm doing. I have my own supplement that has omega seven, omega six, Omega-3, Omega-9, CLA, you have all the fats together. I don't tell anybody. The key to fat is that they have to be on balance, okay? You do not want to consume poly high concentrations of polyunsaturated fat. If you, you will not, if you don't add corn oil, you know, all that crap that they tell you to buy, you'll be fine. Even, you know, if I'm stranded in one island with nothing, Stephen, and they say you have to pick one food to eat, you know what we pick? Breast milk. Nicely packed. <laughs> for free, beautifully with all the nutrients that you need to grow. Well, if the woman is good, but the fat content on that is very important. Now, I know that Jeffrey's an MD, Steven is an MD, I'm an MD, but there's a guy named G-O-D. Man, that dude knows his stuff, you know? And, and it's kind of funny, we are arteries and we are veins to carry water, but we have a, a system of highway called lymph that which is specifically made to carry fat. Right? Why would God do that? We tell people not to eat fat. How stupid. 
how stupid can we be to tell you you don't need fat? Your brain is 71% fat. The bone that you think, oh, the bone is calcium. No, you're wrong. The bone is 68% fat. It's called bone marrow. You have no idea how fat, fat is my favorite subject, Steven. That's why I'm going on and on. But it's crazy what fat loading can do for a person. It's crazy what fat can do for a congestive arterial patient. It is crazy what fat can do for a diabetic patient. If you use them correctly and you do fat loading, unloading fat, all that stuff. It is amazing what you can do with those. You know, Eric, um, there are PhDs, you know, uh, that uh, on nutrition. And Dr. Mary Enig recently passed, but she wrote a book on, on fats. And she was one of the foremost knowledgeable sources in fats. And yes. there, are, there are registered dietitians on every street corner, too, in the United States. And I, I, they got it all wrong, too. I mean, if they were preaching work, we wouldn't be having this massive uh, ep uh, obesity epidemic. So the RDs are wrong. Even PhDs don't have the fat science down very well. And of course, big, big food uh, wants you to be a, a afraid of fat. You know, it's low fat this and low fat that. But we're in the European countries, especially the Mediterranean countries, they, they consume a lot of olive oil. I mean, that's part of their diet. And they'll just take tablespoon, tablespoon of olive oil. And their, their lipid profiles are wonderful. Olive oil, monounsaturated fat, even mono. Yeah. Remember what Jeffrey's saying, mono which is the most abundant fat in nature for animals and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Got it? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. That was very enlightening for me as well. So one, one last question because it's already getting late. Um, I, owe, I owe you. I owe you. So keep going. No, no, no problem. One more question. Uh, what dose, it's about, it's about uh, anabolics, this, uh, this one, what dose nandrolone or mastron will only give positive versus negative? And do you see there is a place for mastron or nandrolone in TRT or HOT? I don't know nothing about steroids, so I'm going to let Jeffrey answer that. Uh, I don't know much about mastron, but I do know there's a Dr. Edward Lichten in the, the Detroit area. He wrote a book. A textbook of bioidentical hormones came out 2000. One of the best books. One of the best great, books. Great, great the, book. The second edition just came out last year. Yeah, really? Yeah. Okay, but listen, he's a big proponent of uh, of uh, nandrolone, especially for older men. Like I said, I used to run uh, 200 megs of nandrolone a week for. That's another name for decaduravoli, by the way, for you guys yeah, that yeah. don't know. I, I ran that for 15 years. And I never had any joint pains. If I did, they were minuscule and I would recover very quickly. Dr. Edward Lichten seemed to think that was the worst thing that a big farmer ever did was uh, get rid of uh, a nandrolone, a DECA, especially for his aging man. He thought it was a great, great anabolic for men. Now, I got to tell you, I found, a, I found a pharmacy in uh, Frisco, Texas called Drug Crafters. And they will compound for me nandrolone at 100 or 200 mg per ml. So I'm currently hitting 20 mg of testosterone sub Q with 10 milligrams of nandrolone a day. That's my that's my regimen. Uh, so I'm getting 30 mg a day, 20 of testosterone, 10 milligrams of nandrolone, and I'm feeling uh, uh not like it did when I was running the mega doses, but I feel it's, it dialed me in and there has been some uh, some joint pain uh, minimization, just going back on 10 milligrams a day of nandrolone. It's out there. Some people don't, you know, don't like nandrolone. They don't consider it a bioidentical hormone. But uh, I was trained by Dr. Ed Lichten when I lived in, you know, was up in Detroit. And I, I really trust that guy's uh, uh, knowledge base. And I think there is a place, a place in hormone optimization for some nandrolone in the, in the aging man or people with osteoarthritis and so forth. So again, uh, I'm back on it, just a low dose, 10 megs a, a day. So I'll, I'll be able to give you some feedback uh, more on maybe the uh, repartitioning ability of that uh, of that element again on that substance. But I have no no experience with Masteron. The, the only only Trenbolone, uh, Anadrol 50, Testosterone, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, what's the other one I mentioned? Oh, uh, Deca. But you know, Anadrol 50 was powerful stuff. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I, I don't know as much as Jeffrey. I all did I was, for 20 I years. To say this. If you're taking Masteron and Nandrolon together, if you don't take testosterone, all I'm going to say is you're going to have some issues. I'm, I don't know much about that, but never, ever, ever, ever take those two and don't have testosterone on board. 
That's are you, all I, guess. I agree with you. You should never be running along. You're talking about Deca Dick? <laughs> are you talking that? Are you talking about that? Pretty boy syndrome. Pretty boy syndrome. You look pretty, but you don't, don't work. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. I know some good urologists that will take care of that with an implant so fast, make your head spin. And anybody want to talk about an implant, talk to me about it. I had it done last year. It cost me $84. Piece of cake. I would have, you know what? The only regret I have, I didn't do it sooner. No way. I had it done. I for the viewers. You know why? I think, My wife's 25 years younger. I'm not taking anything yet, but know that I don't want to. I will in the four dollars. I had it done. <laughs> I would Steven, do it so fast again, make your head spin. We can make that a whole nother talk if you want to. I, I'm a virgin Steven still, but but I, I'm getting old, so I have to maybe in the future. But right, <laughs> Jeff is awesome. I got to talk to him privately. This is awesome. <laughs> Trust me. I, I mean. I, I've been there. Done it all. Buy mix, try mixes, quad mixes, everything. Jeffrey, everything. Jeffrey is one of, I married a, a girl half my age. She's happy I did it, okay? Jeffrey is one of the few physicians that will say this in the internet. This is awesome. And I want you to tell your viewers, no. And I know a lot of doctors. I mean, one of the best doctors, by the way, in the world, anabolic surgery, a guy named Maro Di Pasquale. He's a, yeah. He's a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, actually. And Maro has... That's a book. Yes. Maro is book. Maro, actually one of my best friends. Actually, Maro is an amazing doctor. And he also have a... And I don't know if you've seen it, Jeffrey. Have you seen his newsletter? I subscribe to it, yes. Okay, so you get it. Okay. Stephen, have you ever seen his newsletter? No. Okay, I'm going to send you the last two. Okay, how about that? The okay. newsletter, but they're books, okay? So, so, I, Jeffrey remind me of Maro because he's candid, he's awesome, he tells you the way it is. He's I work in men's sexual health now. I tell guys all the time, if what I do for you doesn't work, I'll send you to the doctor to hook me up. And I, I mean, eighty-four dollars. I never heard of that. Eighty-four dollars. So that is that is good insurance. I mean, I am impressed. I'm gonna. That is awesome, but Stephen, that's how you learn. Stephen is a guy that went to war, and he's teaching you the right things. And, yeah. You know, one last thing we're, we're going to show up. You know, Doctor uh, Michael Colgan, a very, yeah. very good uh, uh, physician that knows about sports nutrition and so forth. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, Mauro Di Pasquale. I mentioned Jose Antonio, but there's a lot of good. Physicians out there that have written good. There's a doctor, there's a steroid doctor out there uh, that wrote a book on uh, anabolic steroids. Uh, Con, Con, Connors, yeah, Conrad. He's a, he's a neurosurgeon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, so, I mean, I read. You want to lead, you got to read. Period. And you know what? Eric didn't learn this stuff in medical school. No, I did not. No, I did uh, not. You know what I learned in medical school? One, one thing. A guy said, Half of the stuff you learn here in this four years is going to be uh, false or, or not correct or incorrect. It's your job to figure out what half it is. <laughs> medical, you learn medicine after you get out of medical school. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, just one last question of the viewer that already asked uh, about the Nandrolone. What is the maximum dose Nandrolone that is still healthy? Oh, well, geez. I, I, I don't know. I guess it depends. I was running 200 megs a week for 20 years, but I've known guys that were doing four, 600 megs a week for 20 years, 30 years, and they're healthy because I see them all the time. I, I'm in the gym every day. I see you. I know who's doing it, and they're running it, and they tell me they're running They show me growth hormone, too. thinking, how do you guys get that stuff? I yeah. can't even get that. And, you know, so that's another talk. Because there are clinics going up here in the United States, left and right, that will advertise testosterone and, and AI and growth hormone, like cookbook medicine. Yeah. I'm thinking, where are, they get the, where are they getting their growth hormone from? I can't legally prescribe it. Not really. It's the only hormone I can't use off-label. So I don't know how they do it. Okay.
I want to thank both of you so much, guys. It's uh, an hour 30, so uh, we'll have to <laughs> uh, rewind this another time. So uh, I want to thank the viewers for staying with us uh, till the end. Uh, don't uh, forget uh, to visit our uh, Facebook group, TRT and Hormone Optimization Therapy, HOT, for more questions. All the experts are in there, like Jeffrey, uh, Danny Bossa, and uh, Wakit Janjua. I want to thank uh, for being the moderators in our chat box. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, time to go offline now. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Eric, talk to you All next right. time. It's very enlightening again. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye now.